Right, very good. Welcome. I'm very pleased to have a nice gathering and a great lecturer, Professor John Radziwowski from Alaska, is going to talk to us at the Helena Modjeska Art and Culture Club about looted artwork and all the various issues that are associated with ownership, looting, provenance, and uh, retrieval of such artworks. It's a very interesting topic, and we're going to see a lot of slides, so it's going to be a wonderful event. Uh, just a couple of words about the club. I have a little picture of a, a model, which is Helena Modjeska, Polish actress who came to California in 1872 and started international career as a Shakespearean English performing in English. Before that, she would perform some in French and not mostly in Polish. She also spoke German. Anyway, so our club founded in 1971 is celebrating its 50th anniversary. This is one of the programs from the 25th anniversary with another picture of Helena. And here's a, a program from our 40th anniversary with yet another picture. This one is ba based on her role as Ophelia. He, she is in her garden of Arden. We're working on our anniversary book, working on our anniversary uh, celebrations on 9th of October. And we've discovered many things about the club such as our founder, is in this book. This is a book of inner portraits but Stash Szukalski, which was recently published. And this is our founder, Mr. Leonidas Darev Osutyński. That's another picture here, uh, which is part two of the portraits by Szukalski. They describe themselves as frenemies, partly friends, partly enemies. And then materials that I got were from the Polish Museum of America and Chicago, very interesting project to retrieve this lost history, even though it was only 50 years ago, still stuff disappears and people don't remember. Anyway, so this is about the club. We're going to have another meeting uh, in May, and then uh, we're going to have a, uh, probably an outing to the beach for Sobutka on the summer solstice in June. Uh, but right now we're entering the realm of scholarships and uh, knowledge, and I'm giving the floor to our wonderful guest, John Radziwowski, who's I'm known for quite a few years from uh, Polish American Historical Association. He is a scholar that published very widely on so many different topics, and um, I'm very respect uh, his research and his work. So uh, let's listen to what John has to say and show for us. Well, well, thank you, Maya, and uh, thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here, so we'll have a few uh, look at our our slides. Okay. Hopefully, everyone can see that. And and while I'm while I'm speaking, uh, you know, please feel free to. If you have questions, uh, you can certainly type them in. Uh, I'll leave some time at the end. For, for questions as well. And uh, this is a, a topic, as I, I, Maya mentioned, I, I research many different topics. I'm interested in many different things. Um, I think life would be very boring if I only researched a single topic. Uh, I do a lot of work on uh, Polish immigration to the United States uh, and uh, modern Polish history, but um, uh, my, my, I also, in addition to teaching history, I also teach art history, and not frequently, but an occasional art history course. Um, and so um, I was invited uh, many, many years ago uh, by a colleague in Miami who was putting together a, a program on restitution in Cuba, uh, or potential restitution in Cuba uh, for Cuban American community um, to, to um, present something on Poland. And, um, and so the, this one thing led to another and eventually uh, to, uh, to the genesis of, of this topic and an article I've written as well. Um, and uh, I, I've given the, a few talks like this. And so, so I'll um, uh, say, feel free to stop me at any, any time, uh, but this is sort of meant as much for a, a general audience as for an academic audience. So hopefully there'll be something that will be of interest to uh, just, just about everyone here. And of course, the picture that you're looking at uh, is Raphael's uh, portrait of a young man. Now, this is not the actual painting, of course. Um, there is no um, color reprinted. This is a, a colorized 
version of uh, the image from a black and white photograph because only the black and white photograph exists. And this is probably the single most famous or infamous work of art uh, that is missing from Poland um, as a result of the Second World War. And as, as many of you are quite knowledgeable about Polish and Pol uh, Polish history, you know that during the Second World War, uh, Poland was invaded by the Soviet Union as well as by Nazi Germany. Um, and the estimates are that 95, somewhere in the vicinity of 90 to 95% of all the art and cultural objects in Poland were either stolen, damaged, destroyed, or displaced in some way. Uh, and uh, so it was a tremendous, a tremendous loss of, of art. And many, many things were, take, were, not, were taken and destroyed. Uh, there were whole archives, libraries. Um, and, and of course, the most famous of these being uh, works, uh, the works of art. But I'll also today talk about something, and I'll describe these as cultural treasures, um, and is, is distinguishing them necessarily a little bit from art. Uh, but these are objects of cultural significance. So we think of, uh, most people think of art, they think of a painting like this or, or a famous sculpture. But uh, we're also talking about things like rare books. Uh, we're also talking about important manuscripts, uh, for example, uh, as we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, original, an original score, for example, for Mozart's Magic Flute. Um, it's not a, a work of art uh, that you would put on a wall necessarily, but obviously tremendous cultural significance. Um, any number of other, other items that would fall into that category. So it's a, much, it's a much broader category than just what we might think of as just fine art. And... Uh, um, if you've watched the movie Monuments Men, uh, which is, you know, actually a very well done movie overall, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a big critic of uh, history on film uh, and, and, uh, and the documentary genre that we see on the History Channel, uh, but uh, it was a fairly well done movie and followed the book. Uh, the book was fairly well written, uh, Robert Edsel's book. Uh, and at the end of the movie, um, there's a scene right at the very end of the movie where German soldiers are destroying artwork. And this is one of the works of art you see being destroyed um, at the very end of the movie. Um, and of course, that's fictionalized. That's not necessarily the case. Um, this, was part, uh, this painting was part of the Czartoryski collection in Krakow, uh, most of which was taken by the, uh, the German governor of... Um, of, uh, of uh, the general government, Hans Frank, uh, for his personal collection. Uh, and um, when the German regime began to fall apart and the allies, uh, the Soviets in particular, are, are, are coming to, to attack with uh, Hans Frank after, um, after proclaiming that he's going to fight to the death against the, uh, against the Soviet invaders, packs up all of his things and runs away. Um, including all of his artwork and uh, his um, uh, obviously Lady with Ermine, uh, probably the most famous of the paintings that he had, uh, the one that, uh, that Maya had the poem about, uh, was one of those recovered by the monument. But this painting was never recovered. Um, what happened to it is, is unknown. Um, the Polish government believes that this painting still exists, um, that it has not been destroyed, that it is out there somewhere. Um, there was a, if you, you actually go online uh, and look this up about six or seven years ago, there was a story that appeared in a number of art uh, publications that this had been, that had been located. Um, and it, it, this location was not disclosed. This turned out to be, um, as things on the internet often tend to be, tend to be fake news, um, and it was not located. Uh, so this is still missing. If you know where it is, you can give me a call, let me know. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the suspicion is that this painting does still exist um, and is, is a, the most famous of all of the paintings. Um, and of course, it, it, it gets a lot of attention as it, as it should, um, and its value is you know, estimated in excess of a million dollars, uh, probably more uh, at this point because it's uh, so rare uh, and so famous. Uh, but um, there's a lot of other objects, a lot of other art um, that is still outstanding, is still you know, missing or displaced. Um, its location may be known, but it's not necessarily in the right hands. Uh, 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 because not only did the, did the Germans 
uh, steal a lot of Polish art, but then the Soviets came and they restole a lot of the art. Things the Germans didn't steal, they, you know, pretty much everything that wasn't nailed down and including many things that were nailed down were taken by the Soviets at the end of the war. And not only from, um, you know, obviously from Germany, but also from Poland and from any other neighboring countries. Uh, and things that were not necessarily, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of that. Um, but what I also want to do is talk about two kinds of claims to artwork that are that, are, that we can we can consider. Um, and there may be more there may be more types of claims. And one of these is a legal claim. Um, this is a, a fairly on one level a fairly straightforward question. Um, if I legally own something. Um, someone takes it, I have a legal claim to, to have that returned to me, um, provided the perpetrator is caught. Say they, they break into my house and they steal something. Um, that's a legal claim. Um, and that can operate in national law. It can also operate in international law. Um, it, it's a fairly well-recognized concept. Uh, but there's also another type of claim that we're going to uh, see, see tonight, and that is what, what I call a moral claim. Um, it's something, and it is, I'll give you some, some examples of what a moral claim is as I go through this, uh, uh, through this presentation. Uh, but the, the, those two claims uh, tend to conflict with one another, and sometimes there's multiple legal, uh, legal claims to artwork, uh, and sometimes multiple moral claims to artwork. And this is, what, this is one of the things that makes recovering and restoring artwork very, very difficult. And, and ultimately, I'm going to give you a rather pessimistic um, assessment of this, uh, that this is uh, perhaps almost impossible to, to fully restore art uh, that has been taken from the Second World War uh, from Poland and, and from other countries as well. But it's also one that has a great deal of relevance today, as we'll see, because the problem did not end in World War II. I mean, World War II was just uh, in a sense, the start of art theft. Um, they're organized, you know, I mean, obviously art has always been stolen. Uh, there are you know, many instances of that. Um, Hans Memling's uh, famous last, last judgment, which is in Gdańsk, uh, was, uh, was taken by Gdańsk privateers and brought uh, in, in the 1500s uh, and, and brought to Gdańsk uh, where it remains today. Uh, but we're talking about the organized uh, systematic theft of artwork, uh, usually by organized states or other organized groups. And that's something that continues up to this day. Um, and it's not a small problem. It's, let's see, it's actually a very major problem in international law, in um, funding of terrorism, and a variety of other things that are going on. So um, the, the, the cases from World War II are they're interesting history. Um, they're perhaps tragic, but they're also things that have a great deal of relevance uh, still yet today. I want to talk about a, a couple of cases and, and I'll talk about one that is fairly straightforward and fairly easy to, uh, to, to consider. Um, and what's what I consider the best case scenario. And the picture that you see here uh, is, the, is called Holy Trinity. Uh, it is was uh, at one point attributed to uh, Georg Pentz, uh, who was a protege of Albrecht Dürer, um, and has more recently been attributed to uh, an unknown or lesser known artist uh, known as the Master of the Lille Adoration. Uh, and uh, this is a late, late, late Gothic, late High Gothic, um, what's called the Netherlandish style of painting, uh, usually from Northern Europe. Um, Modern Holland, Belgium, northern uh, northern Germany, northern France, um, and this was a, a work of art. It was probably part of an, a larger altarpiece, uh, but was acquired by the National Museum in Warsaw in about 1880. What would what would become the National Museum in Warsaw, and it's, it remained there until 1939, until the the Second World War. Uh, when it was w one of many works of art from the, from the National Museum that were targeted by, by German authorities. And uh, the Germans, as some of you may know this uh, already, um, pri even prior to the war, were sending experts to Polish museums um, and basically identifying works of art that they planned to steal, uh, mm -hmm. actually several years, in, at least three, three or four years in advance of the invasion. Um, and this was one of the works of art that had been identified. It had a it had a quote German um, 
uh, uh, provenance, at least according to the according to German authorities, uh, and so it was taken, um, and it was never returned. It wasn't returned to Poland. Um, it disappeared after the war. Um, it appears we we now know that it was uh, purchased at some point after the war, uh, in the I believe the late 1950s by a German businessman who later became the uh, German, the honorary German consul in Miami. And he brought, he was a very wealthy businessman. He moved to Miami, probably for the weather, uh, and brought a, a large number of works of art um, to, uh, to Miami with him, which he donated uh, to a local museum in Miami, including a Holy Trinity. Um, it was there, it was identified uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 1990s um, as the missing work of art from the National Museum. Uh, the honorary con, the Polish honorary consul in, uh, in Miami, uh, Lanka Rosenstiel, uh, was instrumental in facilitating the transfer. Uh, the Polish government, obviously the Polish embassy was involved. Uh, the the Zkaya Museum, which, which held it, was uh, very sensitive to this issue. Um, they, they, they worked with the Polish government um, and uh, eventually the, the painting was returned in where it is now in Warsaw. Um, and this represents what I would call a best case scenario. Um, first of all, this was a painting that was held by a public state-run gallery in a museum in Poland. Um, so so it's a, it's, it was owned by, owned by a, a government, uh, you know, more, essentially more or less. Um, it was in a collection in a country, the United States, which respects the rule of law. Um, in Poland in the 1990s uh, became a country that respected rule of law. Um, you had uh, an embassy and a consulate uh, that could provide assistance. Um, so you had uh, you know, some authority, um, some people to do the work uh, and, and essentially goodwill on all sides. Um, and so this was a fairly easy case of, of, of transfer. Um, and this represents a sort of, as I say, an ideal, an ideal situation. If, all were, if, if this was all we had to deal with, then we wouldn't, I, my, my, my talk would be very short. But, uh, but this is not the case. This is not uh, necessarily the, uh, the norm. Uh, um, another painting, and this one is not in Poland, uh, but uh, this is in Peter, uh, St. Petersburg. Um, and it turns out that uh, a lot of missing works of art are in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, uh, and including huge collections of French Impressionist and Post-Impressionist work, including Degas, uh, Place de la Concorde, uh, and many, many others, uh, Monet and Renoir, and you know, you, there's, there's a huge collection of you know, Matisse, uh, huge numbers of uh, works of, of 19th, 19th and 20th century European art, particularly French art that was stolen by the Germans and it ends up in the Soviet Union uh, and now Russia. And in probably the number one location for stolen art in the world is Russia. Uh, they have warehouses full of art uh, and, and other cultural objects that are just saying that they literally cannot display them all. Um, and, um, uh, and, and this is one of the, uh, the, the major obstacles to return of works of art is countries that do not respect the rule of law. And Russia is one of the, one of the top in that category. Um, and, uh, but just to, and just to give you, there were the Treaty of Riga, which was signed between Poland and the Soviet Union in 1922 at the end of the Polish-Soviet War had provisions or return of artwork that had been taken from Poland and was then in the Soviet Union. The provisions of the Treaty of Riga have not been fulfilled by the Soviet, were not fulfilled by the Soviet government or subsequently the Russian government. Um, so that they haven't fulfilled the 1922 treaty yet. <laughs> so obviously more recent work um, is, is not even up for consideration. Um, there were a few works of art and as we'll see, um, it is possible for work to, to leave Russia and be returned, uh, but under certain circumstances, and I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you an example in, in a moment. Uh, but uh, this is the sort of worst case scenario, uh, is a country, is, is the artwork is being held by a country that does not uh, <laughs> re 
respect the rule of law uh, and does not care. In fact, Russia has passed laws stating that all property uh, in Russia, in fact, it was a, a law passed shortly after, a few works of art were sent back from Russia during the, during the, Yeltsin, uh, the, the Yeltsin government uh, in, in the 90s, uh, and then Russian lawmakers stepped in and the Duma passed a law saying that all, all works of art in Russia at that point, um, and they've, they've restated this law a couple times, belong to Russia permanently and forever, and they can never be given, no matter where they came from. Um, and, but of course, as I say, the Russians don't follow their own laws sometimes, so it's a little murky. This is a, a sort of the worst case scenario, and there are lots of works of art that fall into this category as well, far more than fall into the first, into the first category. Um, even more surprising or perhaps shocking um, is, the, is the question of more um, let's say le less, less sexy works of art um, and uh, more uh, cultural, what do you call cultural treasures, uh, in particular uh, uh, book collections. Um, when the war ended, like I say, the, the Red Army and the uh, Soviet authorities stole everything they could possibly get their hands on wherever they went, um, including huge collections of books. Um, this, uh, this book, and this, this, this is a, a Professor Victor Bosch, um, who uh, had roots in, um, in uh, Germany and actually in Poland as well, uh, but lived at the, during the war, he lived in France with his family. He was a well-known bibliophile, um, knew all of the famous figures in France at the time, uh, famous cultural figures, not only Jewish, but many, many others. Um, and of course, when the war, he had a library full of um, uh, first editions. Um, the, uh, the book that you see here, <laughs> a collection of, of, uh, of drawings by Marc Chagall. Um, and as you see on the, uh, this is the, the cover page, um, uh, Chagall has signed it, but he also added a little uh, work of art of his own, a uh, little, little sketch. Uh, work of art. Um, objects like this are, they're obviously not, you know, works of fine art per se, but they have tremendous, so this is a priceless, um, uh, um, you know, uh, book, uh, very rare book. It's signed by Chagall, of, of Chagall's own work. Um, you, see, you can see the stamp on it. Um, the stamp is the State Library of Belarus. Um, this is currently, this collection, this book is currently in Minsk. Uh, the State Library of Belarus, um, where it has remained for a very long period of time. This is a relatively well-known case. There's a there's a, a a lady, an American scholar, who's been tracking some of these, and she's written a number of articles uh, in in different publications about this particular collection. It's very, fairly well known, but there are many others like this. Um, and essentially, this collection had been taken. Unfortunately, it wasn't destroyed. A lot of the books, especially you know, Chagall was considered a you know um, uh, degenerate artist by, uh, by, by the Germans uh, during the war. And so this is the kind of thing that, that you know, they would have burned uh, in, some, in some circumstances, but this was um, uh, preserved. And, and of course, the, the Germans, despite the fact that they you know, hated a lot of modern art, were, were selling a lot of it off on the side um, and, and making money on it, as, as we'll see, is a, another uh, a feature of, of, of wartime art theft. Um, and uh, but this this collection was taken by uh, by the Soviets uh, ended up in Minsk. Um, now why are uh, why are the Russians or the Belarusians in this case um, holding on to these? Um, this is obviously now if there was a uh, there are two there are two sorts of moral claims that are being made. This is where we come into the question of moral claims. Um, the the Russian excuse or uh, explanation, uh, if you will, for for keeping works like Degas um, painting or, or these book collections is that they have a moral right to these. Uh, and the moral rights comes from the fact that they were invaded by Nazi Germany and the Germans destroyed a lot of artwork and a lot of library collections in the Soviet Union during the war. Um, and as a result, they get to keep these as compensation, which they consider justified compensation for the losses that they suffered. Um, now, um, as we'll see, there are a number of problems with this. Uh, first of all, this collection in particular was not a German collection. Um, this was in, actually belonged in France, um, was, a, was owned by a private family. 
but most of the members, there are a few members of the Bash family that still uh, survived the war um, and their descendants uh, today, but there's no one to make, no one to make a legal claim. Um, the Russian government wouldn't listen to a claim, but there's no government backing up the Bosch family. Okay, this is a private claim versus a government. So this is for the first problem. There, there, there's, there's no authority, no force. Uh, when you have an embassy and a consulate that are going and demanding, um, it's a little stronger, but in this case, it's only a private individual. Um, and so the, the moral claim is that this thing, these things were stolen from the Soviet Union. Therefore, we get to keep things that we found in Germany. Um, regardless, apparently, of where they, where they originated from. Um, now, of course, there's a number of problems with this. First of all, um, and if we think back to a uh, work of art, for example, um, these are not interchangeable. So, for example, you can't say, well, uh, you know, uh, this, um, you know, the Raphael, the, uh, the, uh, one, one Raphael equals a Degas plus two, um, you know, Picasso, Picasso drawings, right? These are, these are not comparable. Each work of art is unique in and of itself, has unique value. It's created in a specific context, um, and you can't exchange one for the other. Um, even, even, if the, even if we believe the Russian claims that they um, and of course, the, the question, of course, the other question in the, the Belarusians make this, the, the, the libraries in Minsk were destroyed by the German invaders, which is true. That there's no question that, that Russia suffered grievous losses um, as a result of the German invasion into their, to their, to their uh, not only to their human population, but also to their, uh, to their artwork. But the question is, what was in the state library of, of Minsk prior to the Second World War? I mean, do we... Do we replace? I mean, you have the, you know, 20 volumes of the collected works of Joseph Stalin, and we're going to replace them with rare books on Marx Chagall. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, but but there's but the Russians and or no, no, neither the Russians nor the Belarusians have provided much of an accounting of the actual losses that they suffered. And like Poland has, as you probably know, there's a, a very good website run by the um, uh, by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. That lists a lot of the the known outstanding works of art with information photographs. Uh, there's nothing quite like that in, on the Russian side. Uh, there's some. Uh, there there is a website called lostart.ru, uh, but it's not. It's very hard to figure out exactly what their um, uh, what what the losses really are, or it's it's not not kept up very well um, for for whatever reason. So this is uh, so these are sort of the the worst case uh, scenarios, if you will. Now here's another interesting. But as I said, with, with Russia, there's always an asterisk uh, beside beside this, um, and this is a very interesting. And I was sort of as I was sort of looking through uh, several years ago, sort of I was I, was, I, I gave this I, I started this article and then I was updating it periodically um, as events warranted, and. Uh, uh, I came across this story, um, and here's a story about a Hungarian, it says, Hungarian rabbi finds 103 stolen Torah scrolls in Russia, um, and so this was a Hungarian rabbi, he was, he, these Torah scrolls were discovered in a state archive in Nizhny Novgorod uh, in Russia, um, and you, you know, this is one of these, this is a picture of the, uh, the, the, the rabbi on the, the lower picture is not the rabbi who discovered them. His, his the rabbi who discovered them. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the the rabbi who discovered them, uh, Shlomo Kovs, uh, uh, is is on the picture on the uh, upper right hand uh, side. Well, this you I read this story and he thinks, oh, this is this is nice. They they found the Torah scrolls and these were scrolls, by the way, that. Uh, when the when the Germans began to uh, exterminate the Jews of Hungary, which occurred in 1944, uh, these were uh, Torah scrolls, and these have not only uh, they're all handwritten. Uh, they obviously have great religious significance, uh, but also uh, are you know valuable in their own right um, and considered very precious to to Jewish communities. Uh, these Torah scrolls were taken from the communities that were wiped out by the Germans in Hungary. Uh, they were put in a warehouse somewhere. Um, the Soviets came across them and apparently took them back, where they ended up in Nizhny Novgorod in the state archives, the Lenin State Archives in Nizhny Novgorod. Um, now, this sounds when you read the story, it sounds like a very interesting, um, 
very, you know, oh, this is a, a sort of happy story, right? But then you start to think about this for a moment. Now, Nizhny Novgorod, um, I haven't been there, but um, it's not exactly on the tourist trail uh, for, um, uh, uh, for, for tourists going to, going to Russia. Um, and so the first question is, why was the rabbi in Nizhny Novgorod? Um, and, it, and the Lenin State Archives are a very large institution uh, in Nizhny Novgorod. They are not open generally to the public. They don't have a card catalog. Uh, you can't just walk into the archives and then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, I discovered, you know, the Torah scrolls, right? Um, they, they don't have materials online, uh, needless to say. Um, so how did this rabbi know that these were there? I mean, obviously, somehow he found out that these were there. Um, and then I began to wonder, well, who is this rabbi? Um, his name is Shlomo Kolbs. Um, he's actually born in Pittsburgh originally. But he's not just any old rabbi, as it turns out. Um, he happens to be, among other things, he's the chief rabbi of the Hungarian army. Um, he is one of the leading Shabbat um, uh, rabbis in Budapest. He's a close ally of the Fidesz government uh, in, in Hungary. Um, and at this time, uh, when this story came out, which was about six years ago now, uh, the and as as Russian government has continued to do this, they can they they try to according the Hungarians for political reasons. Uh, they um, are trying to they, they see Hungary as a possible wedge um, into uh, into Central Europe, uh, you know, to uh, into the EU and in NATO. Um, and they periodically been uh, there was actually a, a whole collection of rare books. Um, there was a, a very famous Calvinist library in Hungary that was taken to the Soviet Union that was returned uh, just a few years before these Torah schools were discovered. Um, and so this wasn't really a discovery. Um, this was, uh, this is a very planned, uh, nothing, nothing in Russia happens by coincidence. Uh, so uh, this, this is a plan, this is a poor political maneuver. Okay, now these Torah scrolls, as far as I can tell, are still in Russia, by the way. They haven't been returned to Hungary. Um, supposedly they were given to some Jewish communities in Moscow. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I, the, the story, the, the, the trail runs cold after that, and what has happened to them since then, I, I, I honestly don't know at this point. Uh, maybe, maybe Rabbi Coves knows the, knows the full story behind it. Uh, but this is the type of thing that often happens when, when things get returned from Russia. It's for this reason. Um, the artwork that was sent back to Poland, there were a number of small works of art uh, that were returned during the 90s by the Russians to Poland. Um, but that was during a time during the Yeltsin government when they were trying to uh, sort of mend some fences with the Poles and, you know, hoping maybe to have some decent relations. That was the same time when they were opening up some of the files on Katyn, uh, the, the ones that they did open up. Um, so it was part of a political ploy. Um, so this really isn't, so this is, you know, returning uh, objects, but it's not really returning them. Uh, and it's really about the politics behind uh, the so-called the so-called so return. Uh, so, so this is a, uh, you know, again, uh, another, another example of the kind of games that they, they played. Um, and, and as I say, the, the Russians are quite guilty of this. Um, and, and, you know, we, you know, we can blame the Russians quite a bit. Uh, but it's not just the Russians uh, that, that have these problems. And this is another very interesting case. Um, and that's the case of uh, Dina Babbitt. Um, now, uh, was originally uh, a, a godly Bova. Uh, now, she was uh, young, you know, as a young woman, uh, was taken, uh, was a, they were Jewish, they lived in Czechoslovakia. Uh, they, were, they were taken to Auschwitz, um, and uh, she and her mother were sent to Auschwitz. Uh, along with other trans, other Jewish tran, uh, transports of Jews from uh, uh, from from Bohemia. In Auschwitz, she came to the attention of Josef Mengele, uh, the infamous Doctor of Death, uh, the infamous Angel of Death. Um, she was an artist, um, and Mengele employed her to create portraits of Romani or Gypsy prisoners. Um, because the, he, he was doing all these strange experiments, these sort of racial experiments, um, and he wanted to convey the skin tone, that's how sick they were, they wanted to convey the skin tone 
of these gypsy prisoners and the, the photography, the black and white photography he had couldn't do that. So he employed uh, Dina Godlebova uh, to do this. Um, she in exchange got better treatment for herself and for her mother. Um, the gypsy prisoners and some of the portraits that you see here uh, that, she, that she created uh, with watercolor uh, um, after they were painted, they were taken off and killed. Um, and uh, then she survived, she and her mother both survived the war. They came to the United States. Um, in the late 70s or in the early 80s, uh, these drawings, these paintings were rediscovered at the Auschwitz State Museum. Uh, and um, she found out about it and she claimed them back. I, she said, I'm the artist, you know, under, under you know, uh, intellectual property, uh, the sort of standard intellectual property law, they belong to me. Um, Auschwitz State Museum, on the other hand, says, no, 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 uh, these belong here. They're documents of the Holocaust. They're the only remaining records we have of many of these prisoners who were subsequently killed. We don't even know their names in many cases. Uh, and they belong here because this is our, we have a right to interpret uh, the Holocaust. And this, is, this helps us to interpret the history of Auschwitz, the history of the Holocaust, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Roma victims that were killed at, at Auschwitz. And then, and by the way, there's a dispute even, even within the State Museum where should these, should these paintings be in the section commemorating Roma victims or should, because ba uh, uh, Dina Babbitt is her name in the United States, uh, she's Jewish, should they be in the Jewish section? Um, so they, they can't quite decide where these need to go. Um, and this is a case that, that went on, uh, uh, Babbitt died, but she passed away. She lived in Los Angeles, uh, but she and her, her heirs are continuing the fight. Um, they've had, they've enlisted members of Congress. Um, there's different laws. There's a whole website devoted to this if you want to look it up. Um, but um, here you have, again, a private individual, in this case, the artist herself. Now, of course, um, you know, these were works of art. You could say they're made for hire. But then she was coerced as well. Um, so she has both a legal claim, potentially a moral claim, to the works of art. The Auschwitz State Museum, on the other hand, has a moral claim to say these belong here. Um, they were commissioned as part of the crime. Um, and we have a right to interpret the Holocaust and to teach that that's, that, that supersedes your intellectual property rights as an artist, Dina Babbitt. And this is where the dispute is. So, so here we have, again, this is a very complicated case, right? Uh, you know, where, where you have uh, different moral and legal claims that are in play. And so when I say these are, some of these cases are very, very hard to, uh, to so where, where does justice lie, right? We want to, we want to be just, we want, um, you know, things to be, to be squared away uh, in, in accordance with our sense of justice, but where does the justice lie in this case? Who, who has the right uh, here and it's, it's a very hard case to figure out. Um, even even Solomon himself would have trouble with this one. Um, even more so um, is the case of the Bruno Schultz murals, um, and and this is where this is where things get really sticky. Uh, now, of course, Bruno Schultz. You probably all know Bruno Schultz. I don't have to introduce him. A very famous writer, artist, critic, um, and. Um, during the uh, uh, Polish uh, Polish Jew, but he wrote primarily in Polish. Uh, his works are, are read widely um, throughout Poland today in schools, uh, taught, taught in schools. Major figure in modern Polish literature. Uh, now, uh, when the war the war breaks out, uh, his hometown of Wilgobich was uh, taken over by uh, by the Germans. Um, and Schultz uh, was actually uh, for a time protected by a member of the Gestapo, uh, Felix Landau, uh, who was one of the one of the leading Gestapo men uh, in uh, in that section of Galicia, uh, responsible for many many crimes, many many crimes. Uh, but he protected Schultz, um, and he had a house that he lived in uh, with his mistress and their children. Um, and he had he employed Schultz to. Uh, to decorate the walls of the house for his children. Um, and he, uh, Schultz, went to paint uh, these paintings uh, having to, primarily from fairy tales, in this case, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Um, supposedly, um, Schultz used the faces of murdered Jews. Uh, he put them on the, on the dwarves uh, and uh, as a sort of protest. 
but Schultz was, uh, Landau got in a dispute with another, uh, another German officer who was also, had, was also protecting Jews. Uh, the, um, and Landau shot one of the Jews being protected by his, his fellow Gestapo officer. And so that officer shot Schultz in retaliation. Uh, and uh, of course, Landau fled uh, as war criminal uh, at the end of the war. These were covered up uh, in a house. Um, of course, it became part of, you know, the, and that's now Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, they were rediscovered uh, by a German filmmaker uh, in, in the 1980s where he was making a film about Schultz. Uh, and they were, um, the layers of plaster that were covering them were stripped off. Um, they, they were recognized as Schultz's, uh, Schultz's work. Then a team came, and this, was, this had made some headlines, a team came from Yad Vashem in Israel um, and took uh, basically, they cut them out of they cut out parts of the wall, and they took not all the not all the murals, but some of the murals, part of the murals, to Israel. Now, this was done without uh, at the time it was the the Ukrainians said this was illegally done. Um, obviously, anyone who I, I've worked in Ukraine, I used to run a project in Ukraine, and believe me, the anything anything can get done with the right amount of money, uh, the right connections. Uh, so, obviously, this was almost certainly. Done with bribes. I mean, there's just a whole question about it. Uh, the Ukrainians complained, um, and uh, then then uh, there were some behind the scenes negotiations. Then the Ukrainians said, "Oh no, it wasn't. It wasn't stolen at all. This was actually a gift from from the, 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 the Israel from from Ukraine." Um, and so apparently, some other some other remuneration happened. Um, there was great outrage about this. Um, there, this is, you know, where, you know, where does this, where does this belong, right? Um, in according to Yad Vashem, um, you know, Ukraine and Poland don't deserve to have anything like this because they're all incorrigible anti-Semites anyway. Um, Ukrainians say, well, this is Ukraine, it's Ukrainian territory. This belongs. This was his hometown. A lot of his works um, related to his hometown. This is, you know, where it should be. The Poles say, well, he's a major figure. He wrote in Polish. He was a Polish citizen. Um, his his works are part of, you know, canon of Polish modern uh, uh, modern culture. They belong in Poland. Um, so here we have three moral claims, three different moral claims being being raised. Um, none of which none of which are, are easily resolvable. So, uh, so this is yet another. Is an, uh, when I talk about more, this is why moral claims become so very, very sticky. Um, and and of course, these are countries. By the way, and in Ukraine, we can say doesn't respect the rule of law, but Poland and Israel, for the most part, do. I mean, no country is a hundred percent perfect, of course, right? In, in respecting the rule of law, uh, but um, you know, and of course, the Poles, uh, you know, very rightly look and they see works of art in Sotheby's and they say, well, this is, we have a, we have a claim to this work of art. We want, we want other countries to respect our, our uh, and, and so does Israel, by the way. Um, you know, there, there are, there are uh, outstanding, outstanding property claims in Israel as well for Israeli citizens. Uh, but of course, um, it's not, it's never quite as um, straightforward as this uh, because um, as, as much as Poland was victimized um, by art theft, um, the, um, the conscience here is not exactly clear either. Um, and this is a good, a good example. That's called the Berlinka Collection. Uh, and this was a, a collection uh, of, this was primarily items from uh, Russia, German state archives, uh, Prussian state, uh, Prussian st uh, um, regional archives, city museums in Basically, what was then the eastern part of Germany, um, they were. The story is, and and again, uh, take it with is is uh, the, the communist era story. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the story was that these were um, where they were placed in a, in a hidden location by the Germans as they were, as they were fleeing the Red Army, um, and were not discovered by Soviet authorities, but were discovered by Polish communist authorities who supposedly kept them under wraps until most of the Soviet units that were charged with stealing things had left, and then they were revealed. And this, is a, this was a collection of very valuable ma books, manuscripts. Um, there are original um, scores by Beethoven, by Mozart, uh, by 
Bach, um, all sorts of rare books. A couple examples are here. They complicate matters yet further. And most of these were clearly German in origin, but not all of them. Uh, there were quite a number of medieval manuscripts that were taken from uh, during the Prussian occupation of Poland, were taken from Polish monasteries um, and put in Prussian state archives. So, you know, if you go back, you know, two, three hundred years, you know, like the Sienese Gradual, for example, was probably in a Polish monastery. It was taken by the Prussians uh, and, and then spent a couple hundred years uh, under uh, under German curatorship, and then it was taken, uh, then it was sort of re returned to Poland. Um, and so the Poles are holding on to these. And why do the Poles say that you'll hold on to these? Well, because Germany took, destroyed, and took so many things from Poland. Um, and so this is a moral claim that, that Poland is, is putting forward. Now, the problem with moral claims uh, is, again, these works of art are not, these cultural objects are not interchangeable. Um, Clearly, the Germans stole and destroyed large numbers of things from Poland. We know this. However, the question the question then becomes, um, you know, where where do we draw the line, right? Um, let's say that, as I as I mentioned before, let's say someone breaks into my house and they steal something from me, and maybe I get it back, maybe I don't. Do I get to punish the children and grandchildren of the original thief? Okay, um, is it, it do we do we hold to a collective responsibility? Um, and, you know, do do all Germans uh, do do we do you know things that are clearly created as part of German culture? Um, and you know, Beethoven uh, works by Beethoven works by Mozart, um, as universal as they may be, as universally loved as they may be, clearly are they're they're clearly were German, uh, and uh, they, these. Germans, they spoke German. Uh, it was an important part of German cultural contribution to world civilization. Uh, and so uh, do is, is there a right to take that? Um, now, the Poles have said and made various claims. And, and by the way, um, parts of this collection were handed back to East Germany during the communist period, OK, as part of a German-Polish friendship treaty that was signed during the communist era. Um, so um, again, the collection is not, as with the case with Russia that we talked about, the collection is not necessarily sacrosanct either. Uh, so, um, so, but does Poland have a right to this? Um, and and if so, uh, what is that right? Is there is there is there there's no legal basis for this? Um, these these were things that clearly had once belonged to Germany. There's a clear provenance from them. Um, and so even even in the case of Poland. Uh, it's not necessarily clear uh, that uh, that these things are um, uh, necessarily, but but again, this is why the moral claims interfere with legal claims. Um, and so, uh, is it just? Is it legal? Uh, these are often two very separate questions. And this is why returning works of art is very very difficult, uh, because um, if if the poll is going to look at the Russians or the French or they look at Russia and say, aha, you're taking these works of art. Uh, you, these don't belong to you. And the Russians say, well, we, we deserve these because we lost so much during the war. Then how can the Poles make the same argument vis-a-vis -vis the Germans? Um, you know, this, is, this is the question. Uh, and, um, and, and, and of course, are we continuing to punish the future generations of people for sins that their grandparents, as, as, as much as we might want compensation from Germany uh, for all the wrongs that they did, um, is this just, is this justified? Um, and that's the, and this is, this is why it becomes very difficult to restore these collections. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, this is not, this is not just a, uh, a, uh, an uh, issue confined to the Second World War. This is an issue that is very, very relevant still today. Um, the, the, the market for stolen antiquities and stolen art is immense. Uh, and the current conflicts and the, the more recent conflicts that have occurred in the Middle East, in Africa, in South America uh, are, are all part of this. And this is a picture uh, from a, uh, a satellite picture. Um, ISIS, of course, has mostly been defeated at this point. Uh, at least we hope it won't come back. Uh, but uh, the terrorist group ISIS. Uh, but these are pits dug by ISIS looters. 
uh, and ISIS had a very well organized system of art theft. And when we saw the pictures of them rampaging through museums and blowing things up, uh, which was you know shocking to the world, and these are Islamic terrorists blowing blowing up all these monuments and smashing things in museums. What we didn't see, however, is that most of most of what they did was take things from museums and sell them off in the black market. In fact, they actually they actually have licenses for people to go hunting at, and this is, you know, many of these sites are Babylonian sites. They're they're sometimes four to five thousand years old. They they contain tremendous potential archaeological and cultural riches. Um, but they actually license people to go and dig in these locations, dig things up, and then they and then they tax them when they sell it. Um, and this uh, after after stolen oil, this is the number two source of revenue for terrorist organizations in the Middle East. Um, the estimates are that ISIS raked in between 10 and 12 billion, with a B, billion dollars on stolen antiquities. And so it's a huge, it's a, I mean, you can buy a lot of weapons with $10 billion. So this is a huge law enforcement issue as well. Um, so all of these, all these claims, and then this is, a, there's a whole unit of, of the FBI uh, that's, that's devoted to, this is actually a very interesting case. Uh, and, and this is a, um, this was a ring um, and this, the, the US government uh, sued this ring. Um, this is uh, uh, one gold, one, it's called one gold ring, US government versus one gold ring with carved gemstone and asset of ISIL discovered on electronic media of Abu Saif. Um, and Abu Saif was one of the, the leaders of ISIL or ISIS's uh, art theft um, uh, ring, and uh, uh, basically by by suing this ring, um, they, they put it on an international watch list, and so it can't it can't come up for legal sale. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a technique that the, uh, the sort of legal technique to prevent uh, prevent them from uh, for, from selling this. Uh, but these things are coming up all the time. This is uh, something that I. Uh, came up with uh, not too long ago. I mean, you you can go on eBay anytime you want and probably find. Uh, this is a, a statue of uh, a, a supposedly a silver statue of Athena, um, somewhere about the uh, you know 1700 to 2000 years old. Um, and if you look down at the the uh, the cellar is located in Cyprus, by the way, which is a well known uh, spot for all sorts of illegal activity. It's a center for the Russian mafia, who by the way are very active in the Middle East. Uh, and this is a major source of revenue, just like the Germans during the Second World War, remember, were selling off all that degenerate Jewish art. ISIS, even though they supposedly hated you know, all these graven images uh, that they were smashing on, 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 on YouTube videos, were actually selling a lot of them off. Um, so kind of the, the same dynamic at work. But you can go on eBay, and, and most of the stuff on eBay, by the way, or well, at least, at least half of it is, is fake, but a lot of it isn't. Um, and a lot of it is coming from these types of sources. Um, so you can go wherever you want and you can find these kinds of things. You can go on eBay, you can go on eBay right now and you type in antiquities, uh, you take in Roman antiquities, Greek antiquities, whatever you want. You can find all sorts of works of art and who knows where, they, where they're coming from. This one's only going for about $12. Um, so if you want your Roman statue, well, there it is, right? Um, and so, um, you know, th this is, um, you know, something like Lady with Ermine or, um, you know, portrait of, a, uh, you know, Raphael's portrait of a young man are relatively uh, hard. I mean, it's very hard for anyone to sell Raphael's painting today. But there's so many other things um, that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so ultimately, um, it's very hard and probably impossible to really begin any kind of serious restoration for, uh, you know, to, to really get back a lot of these works of art from Poland. Um, and, and, and not just works of art, but the, the books, all the other objects that were taken. Um, and I liken this period to, um, if, we, if we think about in our, our, our old history textbooks, they used to talk about the fall of the Roman Empire as a dark age. Uh, and, and, and the question, and, and the question, the, the sort of sad question that I'll leave you with uh, is that was the Second World War the beginning of a new dark age in which large, huge amounts of art were destroyed, or lost, uh, um, and, and ne never to be recovered again. Uh, and, and, you know, this hasn't, it hasn't gone away. Uh, and so um, I, I, that, that's, that's the question, that's the question I leave you with. And it's, it's, it's a very difficult question because there isn't, there isn't an easy answer 
of, uh, yes, we could just return all this art and it'll be just very easy. Um, in some cases, like with the, uh, with the, the painting Holy Trinity, yes, you can. But in a lot of cases, especially with the less famous things, uh, things that are not owned, and, and unfortunately, um, if there's a government behind it, it's much more easy to get it returned than if it's a private individual. It's very hard for a private individual to claim things back from a, a, a museum or anything owned by a government, even a government in a country that respects the rule of law. Um, th this has been very hard. Um, and there's many, many cases. There's a very famous book uh, uh, called The Little, uh, Lady in Gold uh, about uh, attempts to return, to get artwork back from museums in Austria uh, that, that were taken. Um, and it took years and years of, of lawsuits to get a single painting back from a museum in Austria, uh, which obviously respects, the, is a more or less a law respecting country, uh, let, let alone from Russia. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, any, any comments uh, that you might have. Thank you very much, bravo, bravo. Thank you, let me un unmute everybody so that people can start talking. Very interesting and thought-provoking conversation, especially um, in terms of various uh, coexisting moral claims, because everybody has some kind of moral claim, and then is it uh, the right thing to do or not? For me, the whole idea of this kind of wartime loss is actually quite personal when my grandparents uh, on my mother's side ran from the Soviets to the German occupation on the New Year's Eve 1939 because the family members were already shot and taken to Siberia before the big deportations began on 10th of February. They uh, sold everything they could because my, uh, and I had like uh, maybe 200 something gold coins, the South of African coins, the sewn into my mother's coat and they were taken at the border. So they came back to the family of my grandfather with nothing completely, everything was lost. So the whole family, it wasn't just my mother, but all these siblings, they all had little estates and stuff and nothing was ever returned, nothing was ever, um, you know, these are not historical document on national scale, but something that uh, I know the Russia said, well, tough luck, <laughs> there you are. So that's an interesting, another case though, when you talk about the uh, Ber Berlin, collection in Krakow. I, I actually looked at some of these documents I was doing in the, some work in the Jagiellonian library. Like if the documents are in a safe major library, if the artwork or artifact will be completely scanned and put on the internet, every single page of the document is scanned and available for free, uh, isn't it better than having it returned to some tiny little place where they're going to lock it up again and not even have an index? So that's another question here. All right, so let's have the discussion from our members. So thank you very much once more for a great presentation and let's see what people have found uh, of inspiration or to discuss in your lecture. So I have a qu two questions uh, to you. First, uh, thank you very much for this is indeed very nice, uh, very interesting uh, 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 way to shed light on the uh, topic also from a very wide angle from uh, all times uh, to uh, current uh, recent wars. Uh, so not only about Poland. I have two questions if I may ask. The first one is, um, there is a statue of limitation. There's no, such, there's no statue of limitation regarding Jewish owned property which was looted by the Nazis in World War II. Is there a similar provision for art looted or cultural objects looted from Poland uh, as well? And the second question uh, would be um, the uh, Americans, so central collecting point in Munich and Wiesbaden, uh, when they were returning uh, 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 cultural objects, artwork, artworks looted from various countries. Um, in terms, in the case of Poland, uh, the art was returned uh, to the territory of present day Poland. So what happens if the art was, artwork was looted from Vilnius or from Lvov? Yeah. Well, I'll take that question. 
I have to read comment. May I? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, at the beginning, Professor, you mentioned Nazi Germany. 95% of Germans were Nazis. Since 1871 till 1918, were occupied by Germany. So this is not the first time. Are you familiar with the uh, hundred wagons, train full of art taken by Count Potocki, mm. former ambassador to Germany, to Liechtenstein, with the permission of Germans? Then are you familiar that we try to regain Arases from Wawel, from Canada? It took a long time and help of the very famous Polish pianist Małczyński was very influential. Speaking about, you em emphasize that Germans were very brutal and Soviets were very brutal in taking Polish art. I would say they pay more attention to arts than to people. They kill 6 million people. And we are very lucky because Goering was a big lover of art. He organized in a very methodical way uh, repossession of Polish arts. And after the war, we could regain our ownership. Fortunately, those that art was not destroyed. As you know, Hitler was artist. However, he didn't like modern art, as you know. Excuse me, but I asked a couple of questions, so I'm still waiting for my answer. Okay, well, let, let me- I didn't uh, finish yet. Okay, uh, well, uh, well, let me try to answer the questions first, and then I'll, I'll try to, we can pick up uh, uh, on Andrew's point. Uh, in a moment. Uh, now, as far as statute of limitations go, um, there, there is no statute of limitations as far as far as I know under international law, uh, but it, it's governed by something called the Terezin uh, uh, Agreement. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, there was, there was, uh, and that uh, does not, as far as I know, recognize either Jewish or non-Jewish uh, works of art. Um, and so that, that applies to all art that was taken by, and cultural objects taken by the Soviet or sorry, by the, uh, uh, by the Germans during the war. Um, and I think the second part of your question, I can remind me of the second part of your question. Um, yes, uh, so the artworks were uh, returned by the Americans to- uh, oh, okay, uh, right, right, and, and to the territory, the territory of Poland. Yes, so this was, this was, this became a major problem because obviously works of art from places like Lvov uh, were returned to Lvov. They were not necessarily returned to uh, to Poland. Now there were many exceptions to this. This is the problem. Uh, there, there wasn't. There, so, for example, a, a, a good example would be um, the Oslinam collection that's now in in Wrocław. This was in uh, uh, Lvov uh, before the war, um, and uh, was you know obviously it's it's very it's primarily um, books, it's at the library, but also there were things like rare coins and uh, objects of art and so on uh, that were part of this collection. Um, and after the war, the communist authorities basically looked through the collection and every, every item that referenced any territory to the east of Poland's new 1945 border was left in Ukraine and was then, you know, Soviet Ukraine, and every everything else was sent to Poland. So the collection they actually divided the collection. They actually took the collection apart. Okay. Um, so so it was, and and this this became when when works of art were brought back, it was the communist authorities that decided, you know, and often it was a system of spoils and who had the better who had the better connections, uh, who who had the 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 the, the you know. The connections of because the, it was there was a, there was a tremendous amount of corruption that went on. So, that, was so it, yeah. that was also the case in uh, for private property, not right. on for state owned collections, but right. For private. Right, and, and and many of the private things were taken, but as I say, not not even uh, in even in countries that did not become communist ruled, like right. Austria. Like 
things were taken by state museums that belonged to individuals. Um, and, uh, and Gustav Klimt's Lady in Gold was a really good example of that. Like, there's, there's a whole book devoted to that. Uh, it's sort of a popular book, but it, it's worth, uh, worth reading. It shows how um, uh, you know, state, state institutions and governments uh, not, not only rob each other, but they rob private individuals, even their own citizens in some cases. Uh, which uh, was, uh, you know, certainly, a, and and yes, yeah, so, so so there was, and the the, the um, uh, and I, I think uh, uh, Pananji's point about uh, they they respect they respected art more than they respected people is absolutely correct, uh, and um, uh, you know Hitler had a whole he he planned this whole giant art. And Göring Gor had his own private collection, but uh, Hitler had his had a had a, had a, he actually planned this gigantic museum of Germanic art, and uh, you know was he had they had plans for it all, so so yes they 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 certainly they certainly did, and they were we were, were fortunate that, that there were people who respected art, um, and even even if they were criminals and they stole things, um, they didn't destroy them at least, um, which is more than we can say perhaps for some others. Well, the Nazis uh, knew the value of uh, the artworks very well. They even knew the value of the so-called degenerate art, which they uh, auctioned in 1938 in Lucerne at Gallery Fischer, knowing very well that uh, they can not only destroy it, but they can actually uh, sell it and use the money to purchase old masters. This is what they did. Right, and, and some of the German uh, German officials kept the money for themselves. And some of them, you know, there there was that the case of the the gentleman uh, I can't remember. In, in, it was in Western Germany somewhere where his his father had been uh, one of the German the, the Nazi art dealers, uh, and his his apartment was filled with, with oh, he passed away, which was filled with with modern with you know incredible works of modern art um, that had disappeared, and he he just kept them in his apartment. <laughs> Although uh, it has turned out that those uh, artworks were not looted. Yeah. It, it was a, quite a long story and quite a, a scandal in the right. German uh, society and in the media because uh, the first reaction of the media was this is all, this all must be uh, looted art. And it turned out actually that it was not looted. It was right. uh, Cornelius Gurlitz's uh, own collection. Right. And, and, and of course, in, in, in many cases, you know, as, as Maya mentioned, owners were had to sell because they, they needed money um, to, to, you know, and, you know, they, they had to, you know, it was your, your life or your artwork um, in some cases. But I, I think uh, uh, um, Panitribus has a, had a question. I think you know, someone had their hand up. Oh. Yeah, I would like to underline that there was some art taken by Poles or some you know, other people like from Lvov. Uh, and the example we have here, it's the Stika collection. It was abandoned somewhere in New York because this was the huge piece of art. And eventually it was restored. And we have here in Glendale, in the gallery, Resurrection and Crucifixion. In fact, there are other, I understand that there's some artwork in Buffalo as well um, that is still in dispute um, and uh, may, may be returned to Poland or maybe not. I, I believe, I, I, can't, I, I can't recall the details at the moment, uh, but there, again, people were, you know, that in some cases, you know, institutions saved these works of art that would have been lost otherwise. And, and they, you know, they, they, even though they may not, have a, you know, legally own them. Um, there should be some recognition for the fact that they that they preserved them, that they kept them in good condition, um, that we still have them. Um, and and the question that the Maya raised, you know, this question of well, if we digitize them, right? <laughs> a digital copy is not the same. <laughs> um, as much as I love, you know, the I, I teach courses online. I do a lot. I love digital resources for my students, among other things. But it's not quite the same thing as the the actual work of art. But, um, but then the question is, uh, we start to lose the specificity if you say, well, 
you know, a Mozart, the magic flute is one of the scores, I think, uh, the original Mozart score, um, you know, is it, well, it belongs, if it belongs to everyone, it belongs to no one, right? So, so if we say, oh, it's, it's this universal uh, object that belongs to everyone, um, but we're losing the specific cultural context to that as well. Uh, this was created at a specific time in a specific place in a specific language. Uh, and so by, by a very, wow. very important person. So, uh, so you know, and it's, 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 the same, it's the same thing when the Auschwitz State Museum says, well, we have a right to interpret the Holocaust that supersedes the right of the artist. Um, and then in, the, in that case, then what, what justice is there? What, what intellectual property law could stand up to that? Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a very slippery slope um, once we start to go down that route, because I, I can certainly see the case that this is, you know, this, this is being preserved in, in Krakow. Um, you know, uh, it's open to researchers. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it hasn't been destroyed. Um, this is, these are all very good things. And, but on the other hand, um, you know, that, that, that question is still there. Um, you know, does it, does it really belong there? Um, and, and I don't know that the Germans would take it and put it in some, some uh, attic somewhere. I, I'm, I'm assuming they would put it in a major collection that would be accessible to everyone. Uh, but, uh, but this is why it's very hard to, um, to be, to be you, we want to be just, uh, we, we want to be fair, uh, and yet, um, it's very hard to do it in these cases because um, so so many crimes were committed, uh, and and it's you know uh, so many, there were so so many losses uh, mm -hmm. that, that it's it, it's hard it's hard to comprehend, uh, and you know I, I I feel for each of these individuals each of these each of these cases because uh, it cannot it cannot be uh, there there isn't there isn't a clean way. To make everyone happy, um, it's, it's going to work uh, very well. So there's these will all these will continue to be with us for the, you know, we'll probably all be dead and people will be disputing some of these. That's right. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Polish artwork that was uh, sent to America for the World Exhibition 1939, and then it was obviously not returned to Poland but dispersed. Uh, we went to a conference uh, with Polish American Historical Association at one point in upstate New York, in Syracuse, I believe. There is a small college which has a large number of huge tapestries as well as paintings that were somehow kept here um, in America by uh, one of the curators of this exhibit, preserved, and now they're on display in the library in the main, main halls of the university in the library is very prominently shown as a some major uh, uh, aspect of the whole collection and they have a flyers they have booklets they have history and they actually promote this however right now there's a new museum of polish history in poland and this museum wants all this artwork returned and uh, peter obst who is an amateur historian involved with american um, Council of for Polish Culture, he's, he's kind of dealing with it, trying to help the Polish government to say, well, this is Polish artwork, which was sent temporarily to the US for the exhibit and should have been returned years ago. It wasn't, and now you know, they sh it should be returned to be in Poland. But then uh, the college says, well, it was uh, given to us and we taking good care of it and people benefit from seeing it. It's in, not hidden in some warehouse hiding, but it's in public display. We produce flyers, brochures and have events associated with these artworks. So therefore we should keep it. So there's again, like what you're talking about, there's conflicting moral claims and who should have what, right? Right. And, you know, obviously we, you know, if we're, we all I love Polish culture. We want it to be propagated. We want people around the world to appreciate it. We want it to be a museum, um, not just not only in Poland. We want it. It's, this is not just Polish art, but it's world. It, it belongs to. We want people around the world to appreciate it. Polish culture is world culture. It's a world culture. It's a world famous culture. Um, and, but if it's only in Poland, then uh, so. And, but and at the same time, you're from a legal standpoint. I mean, if, if I was just a lawyer, and I'm not a lawyer, so thank God I'm not a lawyer, 
But if I was if I was a lawyer and if I put on my lawyer hat, I would say, okay, it's got to go back to Poland because that that is clearly the 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 way if I was the judge, you know, in, in sitting in the courtroom, that that would, you know, but from a moral standpoint, um, it's much more conflicted. And, and, and of course, if we, when we turn the, lawyer, the world over to lawyers, uh, we, we still won't be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. And the more questions we have from our public. Yes, we have, I see a few more there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, the problem is bigger than even um, artwork and cultural uh, treasures. It, it's the consequence of war and nationalism that we still face as we're becoming a global um, society or, or global culture. Um, I, I think these, these issues apply to land and, and people and identity altogether. So it, it might be impossible to return things at some point in our future, and I hope that's kind of where we're going. Yeah, and of course, if it's but if everything becomes a world culture, then we lose the the the, the beauty of the specific, uh, and and you know so you know this is the, one of one of the one of the arguments. In fact, the polls have made is that you know the Berlinka collection belongs to everyone, right? So it's a universal, and we're just holding on to it. Um, but Poland again. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah, has historically that, that, been torn apart by different sure. groups forever. So right, and 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 as you point out, That's this is a, there's obviously, and I didn't even get into the question of property, like like real property, um, you know, which is a whole you know uh, can of worms. Um, as all of you may know, that the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, by the way, is on land that was taken from a private family. It was a palace, I believe, it was the one. I'm I can't remember the name, but it was a, it was a sort of neo-Baroque palace. We had a very beautiful palace before the war. It was torn down. The land was was taken by the Polish government, expropriated by the Polish government, uh, given to the U.S. The U.S. built the beautiful embassy that we have in its place, uh, <laughs> beautiful architecture. Uh, and so even the U.S. embassy sits on, on property that was taken certainly even even under Polish law at the time after the war was taken illegally. Um, and so, um, in fact, there have been protests outside the US embassy by descendants of the family. Um, so this is, a, it's, a, it's a gigantic, it remains a gigantic issue uh, on, on, many, on many different fronts. I would like to remind, do you hear me? Yes, yes I do. In 19, after World War II, it was a question to return or not to return Polish possessions to Poland. For example, are you familiar with the Polish gold? Yes, yes I am. So Polish gold was returned, actually taken by General Tatar, who was head of the communication section in the London government to communistic Poland. And that gold was disappeared was a big question. Why yes. did he do it? He was considered as a traitor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, and, you know, there, there were, you know, that, that was a, obviously, uh, you know, it, there, was, there were many people who decided to return and felt that they could, that even, even if it was dominated by, by the Soviets, that they could still live there as Poles. And as we know, many of them found out otherwise. Uh, you know, when, when they returned to Poland, many, many didn't, uh, of course, as well. So, yeah, and I, I think uh, uh, Ms. Tribus had a, had a question as well. Yeah, I think this might be a very good topic for, for a new movie because The Lady in Gold was a very interesting movie and very well done. And maybe some people would like to write a, you know, screen. <laughs> we don't have screenwriters. We do have the directors, we do have professors who teach theater and movies and film, but well, and we, we, could, we could have uh, you could have a movie. I think that the, the, the movie script would be to be recovering the lost Raphael. Um, and we could have a uh, uh, we, we need to have like a, maybe a, I was thinking a James Bond movie, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to it's a very good the, salt. I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the lady with Ermin, 
uh, the beautiful painting by Damas Wasiczko by Leonardo. I think it's one of those things that really, really could be uh, basically, you know, shown uh, in, in a movie history because uh, I actually read somewhere the story of it. That's why I wrote my poem because it talks about the Minutemen, talks about the Soviets, talk about the Hitler's museum because that's where it was supposed to go. He, Hitler took it from Frank. Right? There was like tug of war. Everybody wanted to have this painting for themselves. So that was uh, something quite quite special about it. And uh, yeah. then it goes back, and it's back in Poland, and it's back on public view where it where it started, and it was for many years it was legally purchased by the Czartoryski family, so it was not like something that was looted to start with, right? So there's a very good story and a very beautiful painting that hopefully maybe somebody will will tell and do at least a documentary film, because I think that we we need more of these stories which have a happy end. Of course, we all <laughs> grieve for the lost Raphael and also many other things. I still remember stories about the Amber uh, Room, Komnata Burstynowa. There's so many stories. Some of the claim mm -hmm. they found the train, some of the claim they found it. Some of the, it's just like the ongoing mystery, whatever happened to this art artwork and where is it? So, you know, there's a lot of mysteries to it. Well, but they're, they're still, yeah, they're still digging in Silesia. They started us a new, I saw a new dig uh, somewhere in yeah. Silesia uh, to supposedly there's gold or art or whatever that's buried mm -hmm. there. But, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, very, uh, there's, there's so many, uh, so many of those stories that, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, that one could tell. So it's, it's still, it, it's fascinating. It's, it's a fascinating area. Of so what do you think about like if there's a ship and it went down and now the treasure hunters employ those kind of underground submarines, uh, underwater submarines, cameras and all sorts of equipment to retrieve the gold that went down like 17th, 16th century with some galleon somewhere. Uh, and then somebody says, well, it's our gold, but it's 400 years it was underwater. So now whoever found, found, their, found their keepers, or like in England, I think they had a farmer who, who was plowing the field and hit a clay pot with a whole bunch of Roman coins, some of them gold, you know. So what, what is the moral claim here and what is the law? In England, and maritime law is actually fairly clear. There's actually a maritime salvage law um, that's, that's a lot clearer. Um, there, some of the claims there, Spain has, uh, there, there's a ship off the coast of Colombia that the Spanish government is disputing. Uh, there was, you know, a, a Spanish galleon that went down. But um, England actually, and, and I, I'm not sure about the law in Poland. Um, there's been quite a few discoveries in Poland by metal detectorists. But in, uh, uh, in England, they have a, actually a very sensible law because metal detecting is very popular as a in fact, there have been a number of, of Poles living in England who've discovered important things, by the way. Uh, there, there was a, a Polish man in Scotland who discovered one of those, one of those hordes. But what they, what they do is that um, if you, because the temptation, if there isn't a good law and someone finds something, they, they take it in secret and, and sell it, right? So, so in England, if you find something in the UK, if you find something with a metal detector, you get, the, they, they divide it up. Uh, it, it goes to a museum like the British Museum or one of the other important museums. The landowner gets paid, gets a paid a large, and they're large sums of money because many of them are very valuable. And the metal detectorist also gets part of it. So they divide, so the, 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 the objects go to a museum and then uh, there's, a, there's a fund that's set up and the landowner, and I think in some of those cases, they got, you know, 200,000 pounds and the metal detectorist got 200,000 pounds or sometimes, depending on the value of the, of the object. It's actually very sensible because it rewards people for doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, they've had- they've had the Treasure Act? Is it called the Treasure Act? And so very nice, it's, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's so great. It's, it's, so it's a, very, it's a very common sense and some countries don't have that. So you don't see, this is why you see so many discoveries coming from England because there's a, it's, it's obviously a hobby. People like to get out and detect things with, with their metal detectors, but it's also gives you, uh, uh, there's actually a potential reward uh, that, goes, that goes with it. And I, I would say, and regarding with Lady with Ermin, one of, the, one of the important things to remember about Poland in particular is that during the partitions, um, when Poland was ruled by, by Russia, by, uh, by, by Prussia as well, 
uh, and by Austria, um, that that for many Poles, collecting European art, like Lady, and this is why the, one of the reasons why the Czartoryski family was so interested in collecting some of these works of art and preserving them, was to show that they were still part of European culture, um, mm -hmm. and that was a way of expressing their their Polishness, uh, especially in the, in the in the Russian sector. You know, when there was so much Russification going on, uh, that that it was this by by making your house a temple of European art, um, even in a small way, even if you were not a very wealthy family, um, was a way to show that you were not, um, you know, giving into the, uh, into the czar and his, because they were, you know, not interested so much in European culture. And so being a, being a European was in a way uh, part of defying the, the partitioning powers and, and showing your, your Polish patriotism. So ironically, collecting paintings like Lady with Ermine or this, this is why it's so connected, I think, with Poland, uh, because um, it was part of that effort to uh, preserve a sense of Polishness that was really part of part of the European family. Uh, and Poland had been separated uh, because of the partitions for so long. Um, so it was a way of reaffirming that that bond uh, that, that the Poles felt was in danger. Thank you. That's a very interesting statement. I really like that. Asserting Polishness by being European. So by, by showing that I, we are European, we are Polish. And, so and culture, culture and culture. I mean, remember, uh, <laughs> Russia was not exactly a, a cultural mecca. <laughs> yeah, I, love, I love Russian, I love Russian literature, I love Russian music. But, uh, for, for many, many years, the Russia was, Muscovy was, uh, was a backwater, I'm afraid to say. Um, no, no, no insult. I hope to the Russians, but uh, you know that's. How the, about the uh, older Polish like um, documents and royal uh, writings, letter that went to Sweden when the Swedish flood came over? Some of them are still in Sweden, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know I thought of writing a letter to the Swedish government. Um, it was yeah. interesting when I lived in Minneapolis. Uh, there was a this, uh, the obviously a big Swedish population in Minnesota. And there's a Swedish institute, it's like a major institution. So they, the, the royal family, uh, you know, uh, sent a whole collection of artwork over and, and, and the, the, the marquee item was the, the armor of Zygmunt Vasa. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, but it was funny because it was in the, on, the, on, the, on the front page of the newspaper, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, this big, it was very, you know, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful suit of armor. Um, and, and I, 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 I wanted to write them a letter saying, <laughs> no, <laughs> not no. Swedish, not Swedish. <laughs> but you know, this is. But again, you know, if, if we were to go back, and you know, uh, how how many things did the Mongols take, right? Or you know, exactly. You know, this, this, no one would own anything at this point, and we could we could end, you know end up end up at war with each other all over again. So. Yeah. And the concept of museum, a place that's sacrosanct, because it's like a temple to art from every nation, every culture, every language. Some of these cultures uh, further out in the East, they didn't have a concept of artwork. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a concept of a museum. These are Western concepts. It's a, it's a very modern concept too. Um, th this idea that, that most people Art was part of their everyday life. This is, you know, the folk art is like you, you're enriching your everyday experience with art. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea that you put it on a wall and look at it, as opposed to interacting with it. This is, you know, religious. This is what I try to explain to my students. You know, religious art is in some way different because it's part of, you know, icon. For example, is is an aid to prayer. Um, you know, it, it help it helps you meditate on on scripture. It helps you meditate on your prayer. Um, and it, so it's more than just an image, yeah, you know, yeah. there, there's more to it than that. Um, and so uh, it, it is a very interesting, but, it, but it, the idea of putting it on a wall as a display is, is very modern. Um, and, and this is why when families like the Chartariskis, um, they're, they're, they're really very modern. This is very, really, by our standards, it's 200 years, 300 years old. But at the time, this was a very advanced concept that they were, that they were developing. I would say the uh, English invented that when they looted all the Egyptian artifacts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's yeah. If, if there, there's a uh, there's a very interesting museum in London called the uh, it's called this uh, it's the Soames. Um, it, it's a house, and it basically most most museums 
were some wealthy family. They collected a whole bunch of curiosities, artwork, um, you know, uh, mummies, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, they, they put them all in there, no rhyme or reason. Um, and and that, that museum in London is a good example of what a museum 200 years ago would have looked like because mm -hmm. it has wonderful works of art, but it's got all sorts of, yeah, all sorts of things jumbled up on the walls and uh, different fragments of, of you know, uh, Roman Roman sculpture or a Greek statue or Egyptian, this, you know, this, that. Yeah. Just knickknacks and touch key. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I went to a Kazanovia where Grzyna Kozaczka is a professor and they have a small local museum in, in Kazanovia. It's a city museum and it owns a mummy. It owns an Egyptian mummy because somebody went to Egypt and brought the mummy to America and they oh, gave it to this museum. Yeah, they, they were up for sale. People, people were, yeah, people were grinding up mummies. People used to grind up mummies for, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was medicine. They, they would grind it up for medicine. Um, you put it in an infusion it would cure it would cure whatever disease you had uh, yeah they, they were the people were selling them off like like crazy oh yeah yeah that's completely crazy <laughs> all right i had lots of fun and uh, discussing and asking questions now is anybody else to have a question in uh, I yola I don't have a question, but I want to mention that our uh, Getty uh, Foundation or Getty Museum uh, was uh, for years were buying uh, art on the black market. And uh, uh, actually years ago, they were publicly um, uh, kind of uh, were saying that uh, wow, they were actually not keeping everything what they supposed to. They should buy. Uh, they should buy on the auction, not on the black market. But that was the time when they uh, mm -hmm. he had money and he was a collector and he wanted to buy a lot of art and preserve the art. So. Should we say, oh, this guy was a bad guy or he was doing um, um, something good for us, preserving the art for future? Can I, can I is that, Conrad, Conrad, I would like to respond to that because uh, I am with the Gary since 30 years and I am not involved in this uh, uh, scandal, should we call that way. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the uh, ancient artifacts, mo mostly Greek and Roman, were not purchased by Mr. Kelly. They were purchased by a curator, Marion True, who had to um, accept the consequences of that and she, she left. But it was not Mr. Getty, who purchased those artifacts. That's just for the record. Okay, Conrad. I was, I was gonna say that, you know, I mean, obviously uh, Isabella is gonna know more than I do, but uh, um, from what I understand is Paul Getty was buying stuff early, early on, the same way as uh, Norton Simon was doing it. Some of these things were in, let's call it international water. So they were in disputed territories. There was no claim to ownership. This is. These, these claims to ownership came a little bit later, you know, when Greece sorted its its political situation, uh, you know, which which it had with the military junta with the collapse of the government. Then they started revising borders and claiming things like, you know, maritime laws. And there's a famous statue at the Getty. Isabella knows which one I'm talking about, which was fished out from the Aegean in what was at that time international waters. Now, look. I understand it's obviously a Greek statue, just like you know the gigantic Egyptian pillar sitting in the Vatican is obviously Egyptian. But you know, there, you know, when when Isabella asked earlier, I mean, I had, I had technical problems, so I was in and out on this meeting. Um, but she asked earlier, are there limitations? And uh, the professor had answered also recently about about the Mongols. You know, at some point in time and in space, there has to be an agreement. If you're finding somebody something in the middle of the Atlantic, 
uh, and you know, it, it looks that it's German or it looks that it's Greek. At some point, it's not doesn't belong to anybody. It's fallen out of the loop, and these governments are making retroactive claims. You know, is I I, I want to ask you, uh, the, the professor, whether you think that it's also legitimate for the break of continuity. The second Polish Republic is not the third Polish Republic. In between the second and third Polish Republic, there is the Polish People's Republic. You know, granted there was a government in exile, but there's very often this case of this break of continuity in terms of what I would call, um, you know, who is in charge of something. What's the name, chain of evidence in, 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 in uh, you know, who has, the, who has the claim to it in terms of time? If the government has ceased to exist, you know, sure, the Russian people can claim that imperial Russian goods are Russian goods, but there is no Russian empire anymore. It's, it's a new country. Well, and this is, um, you know, obviously it's a very sticky problem. Um, you know, we're, we're um, apparently even now in our own country going back a couple hundred years talking about reparations for things that happened 200 years ago. Uh, so <laughs> we are, um, you know, um, do, do we have a claim against, do, you know, we have a claim against the Confederacy. Uh, you know, this is, uh, but, uh, you know, part of, the, in, in the case of Poland, and I'll, I'll just be very specific to there, um, the, the, third, the third Polish Republic um, uh, that, that emerged after the fall of communism uh, assumed all of the assets and the debts and obligations of the Polish People's Republic government. Um, and so from a legal standpoint, and this really has much more, to, much less to do with art than it does with things like sovereign debt, and, you, know, the, you know, a variety of, you know, all the things that the Polish government previously owned. And, and this was, the, of course, the question at the end of the Second World War, when, uh, you know, all the embassies, for example, which were uh, sovereign territory of the Second Republic, were turned over to the communist authorities. Um, you know, th this was this was uh, you know this this was this transfer, um, and so when when the governments succeed one another, they generally um, assume the, the property and the obligations and all everything that comes with it of the previous government. Now, sticky parts come with things like the so-called recovered territories, the Pratsmav, or. or uh, Szczecin or what or what have you or Lvov or, or or Vilnius I mean you know where where then then where and especially with private property because with state property it's a little easier because usually the government says yes we're going to assume ownership of all of the things that the previous government had even if we don't agree with them we don't uh, but um, and, and this is this is you know, the, the question about the gold reserves um, this is why the gold reserves go back to Poland at least in a sort of legal sense um, I don't think morally that the, the communists didn't deserve to get the pre-war gold, but um, you know, from, from a legal standpoint, when when the this is why when the lawyers take over, um, you know, things things happen quite differently. Um, so in in that sense, but but you're absolutely right, and your larger point is absolutely right. I mean, the, you know, there there is no. It, it's going to be it'll, it'll make it'll make the world impossible to live in. If we're constantly going back and revising those claims, and you know, because often it's not only governments, but it's also individuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I live in a region with a, a very rich tradition of art that goes back thousands of years. Um, anthropologists came and they basically robbed people's homes and they took them to museums um, without asking them. Now, you know, to what extent do those families or those of those clans that own that artwork, like totem poles or other objects? Which are in museums all over the world. In some cases, uh, do they have the right to uh, to repatriate them? Um, one of the things that people have done here is, like for example, there were totem poles that were taken. They belong. They belong specifically to families. They're family. They're actually family heirlooms. Uh, they're, they're not just public art. Uh, they, they commemorate family. Uh, they're like memor family memorials in a sense. Um, what they've done in many cases is they've commissioned a new totem pole given the new totem pole to the museum and then brought the old totem pole back. So there's one. Well, I thought it was going to be the other way around. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so that, that's one. So there, there are, there are a few creative ways to, to figure out some of these questions, but, um, but in the main, you're right. I mean, the, the, with maritime law, if it's in the middle of the ocean, then it's, you know, it's essentially up for grabs. There's a salvage, there's international salvage 
that, that, that comes into play. But um, it's uh, but like you said, one once you start down that slope, <laughs> you'll you'll will never will never recover, and and you know we'll, we'll make our world unlivable. Um, we, we can't we can't compensate for the wrongs that were done in the past. Um, and ultimately, when I, you know, when I, if I, when I was to conclude what, what I gave in my talk is that we can never, we, we can, you, you can never repay Poland for what happened to it. You can never repay the Polish people. All the works of art, all the ratios in the world don't amount to the life of one child that was killed. Okay, so there's no, there's no way to, you know, we, we have to live with the past. We cannot, we cannot make amends for it. It's just impossible. There are too many, too many things happened to make amends for it. And it, once we start to try, we begin to create new wrongs in the present that are, are you know, not. We, we, we create a whole, a whole new set of, a whole new set of, of, of crimes would potentially, uh, like for example, if we were to repay, we were to repay every penny earned by the slave trade, um, you'd have to rob people in the present to repay the past. And you, you'd create you'd create a new set of wrongs, um, and um, you know the, this is this wouldn't be justice. Would you say that greater crime is in the destruction or the hiding of the treasures than than merely just the stealing of them? Like even if they display them in the Hermitage or someplace, at least it's doing some good, right? Or an Auschwitz. Yeah, and, and and unfortunately, in the case of Russia, there there are a whole there are a whole lie there are a whole warehouses full of rare books that are just rotting away. Um, yeah, they're they're you know so, that's the real so, crime, right? Yeah, th that's that's the greater crime, uh, obviously. Um, you know, so um, but you know the Russians don't they, the Russians don't care. Um, you know, they they give the big middle finger to everyone. So, oh wow. However, I would like to get a metal detector and go to England and get two hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> well, I, well, I, I think Poland is developing a law similar to that. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't quote me on that, but but there have been a number of metal detectorists in Poland uh, that have found some important objects, including some Roman coins, by the way. Oh, wow. Um, and and some, some, you know, coin stashes, because you know, any any place that's been lived in for thousands of years. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, so Pol and Polish archaeologists are very, very good, by the way. They're some of the best, best archaeologists in the world. Very nice. Okay, so on that note, I think we're going to thank you very much, uh, John, for this amazing lecture and fantastic discussion. Thank you, everybody who attended and participated. I think there was very thought provoking, very interesting, new information and new ways of looking at things. And just to untangle the complicated web of ownership, moral claims, multiple moral claims, different sides having claims to the same artwork for different reasons. So this is all very interesting and I'm very, very grateful that you came to us and shared with us all this information. For the club, our next meeting is May 22nd. And if nobody, else has to anything to add I will just say good night and thank you very much and we'll uh, see you next time thank you bye bye thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you very Pleasure. much thank you very much professor thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.